Yo, what up, Psy fam? It's your boy Nickel here, and today we're going to look at the state of COVID-19, at least up into April 5th, 2020, which is the day that I have conducted most of this research, and I'm also recording this video. Um, but a lot of this research came from these folks here, um, mainly from the Peter Atia the Drive podcast. Uh, he's an MD, a medical doctor. Uh, David Sinclair, a PhD. Peter Hotez, MD and PhD. Michael Osterholm, PhD and MPH. Um, and also Joe Rogan for hosting many of these people on his podcast as well. Um, and these conversations that have happened on these podcasts have really provided a lot of insight into the current state of COVID-19. And they've really dug into some very interesting questions that I think are important for us all to really consider as uh, this all unfolds and to keep track of as well. So um, as we get started here, as I said, the research and the research happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, today, though, is April 5th, 2020. Um, and so the information is current up to this point. In the next week or so, things could change. So I just want to put out that disclaimer. Now, I like this picture here to start us off because we've talked about the ACE2 receptors um, in the alveolar cells. So if this is an alveolar cell here, this is the protein that is on the outside of that cell. Now, you can see all the folded protein here in that ACE2 receptor on the outside of the alveoli cell. Um, and that ACE2 receptor is where these things, these spike proteins, from the SARS-CoV-2 will actually dock. So you can actually see what it actually looks like, or at least this is a model of what it looks like. So maybe you're not so interested in science, but if you're a graphic designer, this would be a great career path because in these times where we have these uh, pandemics or really large scale science um, related things unfold in the news, we need people to be able to communicate these to the public. So here we go, there's a good picture. So we're gonna start by looking at current models and predictions. And we'll look at some medical interventions um, and we'll continue on from there. So this is gonna be a two-part series starting with current models and predictions. Now, Michael Osterholm uh, has said, and he's quoted saying that all models are wrong, but some just provide um, useful or helpful information. So even though they're wrong, they can still help. And it's good to just keep this in mind because as we see a lot of different models in the um, news and such, it's important to know that they're not all accurate and that scientists are doing the best that they can. So here's an example of a model, um, a model of an epidemic uh, in our current epidemic of SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID disease epidemic. You have to really take into account a lot of different stuff in order to make these models. Um, this one is hosted on this website here. So if you wanted to really go and start playing with the variables to see how the different variables affect this epidemic, um, you can do that. If we look down here though, at the different dynamics that create this type of kind of bell curve here, there's a lot of different stuff that goes into this, including the size of the population and the number of people um, that are initially infected as well as that R not number or um, the measure of contagiousness, you could call it. Um, the incubation period, uh, the duration that someone is infectious for, the case fatality rate, the time from the end of the incubation to actually someone um, being deceased from this and so on. So there's a lot of variables and every single time that you move one of these variables and increase or decrease uh, one of these numbers, it definitely is going to cause differences in this curve. And so they're doing their best as scientists to try to understand all the data that's out there so that they can move these circles and create all these variables um, to be as accurate as possible. But um, I really liked what Michael Osterholm said and that they're all wrong, but they do help. And so we're using these models in order to make a lot of the protocol now in the United States and across the world. So um, when you when you see these models, just take it with a grain of salt and know that they're changing all the time. All right. Now that we've got that out of the way, I know there's a lot of questions. So we're going to start answering some of these questions. One of the questions I think that's really important um, that definitely impacts those models is, can you get infected a second third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time if you overcome being sick once. Well, some scientists were really curious about this because that is super important um, as we try to design the models is understanding whether or not someone can get sick a second time. 
So what the scientists did was they actually infected some rhesus macaques, monkeys, and uh, these monkeys actually um, are similar to chimpanzees and to humans. They share about 93% of a DNA sequence with humans. And so by infecting these monkeys, um, they were able to infect them once and then have them recover and then try to infect them a second time to see whether or not they would end up um, being infected by COVID-19 a second time. And in the study that they did here, they were not infected a second time, which gives us a lot of hope. Also, if we look at MERS and SARS, uh, both of those also have some immunity once your body's been able to overcome that disease. And that's because those antibodies are in the body and they're able to fight it off a second time. So that's at least hopeful in that, um, you know, at this point, scientists do not believe that you can get infected a second time. So you do get immunity from it if you become infected the one time. All right, well, the people that are becoming infected, um, it's definitely not everyone being infected or affected the same. And so a good question to ask and that people have been asking is who is at the highest risk of severe illness or of death? So in China, if we looked where it started at, um, men that were over the age of 65 years old, there was a lot more men that died from this that were older men. But when they actually start to look at some of the other things that might have contributed to that is that if we look at the dynamics of the society there, 70% of men in China smoke, um, especially over the age of 65. And if you look at that same group of women that are over the age of 65, only 2% of women smoke. And so they thought maybe, well, smoking must be a contributing factor. And what they found is that smoking it actually increases the number of ACE2 receptors on those respiratory cells. And so as I showed you that picture up above, you know, we've got all those ACE2 receptors on the outside of the respiratory cells. Well, someone that smokes is going to have even more of those on the outside of their respiratory cells. And what that means then is if a virus comes along and it's got those spike proteins sticking out, there's a lot higher likelihood that it's going to infect that respiratory cell if it has more ACE2 receptors. So smoking increases the number of ACE2 receptor cells. Um, and right now they're really curious about what vaping does, and they're not quite sure yet the factor of uh, vaping in this COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 interaction with our ACE2 receptors. Um, so smoking is definitely a major factor, but one of the main factors, and you've probably seen this in the news, is age. Um, so not only were those those men in China the the people that um, had or the group that had the highest death rate, not only were they smokers, but they're also older. And so we're seeing that across the world is that the older populations are definitely more impacted by this uh, SARS-CoV-2 and have more of a reaction from COVID-19. So age is a major factor. Um, especially people that are over the age of uh, 65, 65 and older, um, have more severe consequences from this. Some other things, though, that are also impacting people that cause them to have more of a reaction and a more severe reaction from COVID-19 and even death are things like hypertension, which this is basically just a fancy word for high blood pressure. Also, diabetes. Um, diabetes type 1 and type 2 are both uh, factors that increase the severity of the disease. Renal disease, which is basically just any type of kidney disease, is also uh, contributing to a higher severity of the illness. And then obesity as well. Now, something that's very interesting is that as this um, illness starts to infect more and more people across the world, um, at first, when it was in China, and we looked at that, the group of people that were getting sick were mainly older individuals. And now we're starting to see a lot more younger people getting infected or affected by this. And it's not only young people, but they're starting to see people, you know, in their late 20s on up getting impacted by this. And one reason in the United States, at least, that we're noticing that a lot more younger people are being impacted by this is actually related to obesity and diabetes. Um, these are typically underlying factors that are there. And if you're younger and those things are impacting you, then there's a higher likelihood that the SARS-CoV-2 
virus can cause COVID-19 disease in a very severe way and even cause death. So those these contributing factors are not, are starting to get scientists to look away from just age um, because there's more than just age that is a factor here. Um, and in some cases, they've actually have seen some infants that have had some really severe reactions from this COVID-19 disease. Um, and some kids as well, but not many kids and adolescents. It's mainly late 20s and up and definitely in the older populations. Well, when people do become... Um, affected by COVID-19, then they need to seek medical treatment. And it's kind of crazy because right now there's actually no cures. And when I mean cures, it means like if you go to the hospital for COVID-19, they don't have a medicine they can give you and say, okay, take this medicine three times a day for the next four weeks and it'll take care of it for you. There are no cures right now. They can't hook you up to anything that's going to cure it and just take care of it. They are hooking people up to ventilators, but ventilators just help get oxygen into the person's body and it helps them breathe. Because um, with this being a respiratory illness, those lungs that we have, uh, if they start filling with fluid, then our lungs can't work as well. So they have to force air into our body in order to uh, get our lungs to actually be able to transfer some oxygen into the blood. Um, So even though there's not any cures, that's kind of something that's really stressing the medical industry right now, but scientists are racing to try to find some type of relief, uh, whether it's a vaccine or some type of drug. And right now, there are currently 57 drug trials that are working on trying to solve this, and there's 39 vaccine trials, and those are all underway right now. Now, these aren't things that can just be done in the snap of fingers, but it takes a lot of time so that we know that it's effective because you wouldn't want to give medicine to a group of people and then cause it to actually cause more harm. If they weren't even in harm beforehand, you could actually get people sick that weren't going to become sick. So they have to go through all these certain hurdles. They have to overcome hurdles so that it's going to be effective. So when people take it, they can have confidence knowing that it's going to work. So since there are no cures, right now what's uh, happening is that when people get to the hospital, um, there's a lot of the medical professionals just have to do their best to try to take care of the person and try not to become sick themselves. So some some scientists and other professionals are trying to come up with ideas for protecting healthcare workers because healthcare workers are standing there um, with tons and tons of virus around them. And so they are actually becoming very sick themselves. So in order to try to help keep our healthcare system strong, Um, those N95 masks that you probably heard a lot about are super important because these actually stop aerosols. And aerosols are those smallest little particles. Now, a good way to think about aerosols is if you've ever been sitting in your room or in a house or whatever, and the sun is outside shining bright, and you actually see those beams of light, or at least that's what it looks like when it comes through the window, and you see all those little particles floating around. Oh man, my house is so dusty, I should clean said no teenager ever. But if you see those, those are actually just from breathing and talking. Those are just normal things that go into the air when we exhale and breathe and talk and sneeze and cough and all that good stuff. And that's there all the time. So when someone is sick, that stuff just kind of floats in the air. And those N95 masks protect people from 95% of that, those aerosols that are just there floating in the air. Um, And then PPE is another thing that you've probably heard a lot about, and that stands for personal protective equipment. So when people wear gloves, that helps keep the virus off their hands or um, wear gowns to keep the virus off their clothes. It helps them not get contaminated. So one way we can protect healthcare is by having a lot of PPE and those N95 masks. So there's a lot of people that are currently working on manufacturing more of those. But the whole world needs them right now. That's why we have a short supply is we have so much demand for them that we just can't keep up or when I say we, I mean the, the, the makers of those masks. Okay, another idea that um, people have is to change the way that we hold patients. And instead of having one patient per room, having different wards or groups of patients, like 18 to 20 patients in one room. Because if they all have coronavirus and we have a bunch of people in one room, well, they're not going to infect each other any worse than they're already infected because they already have that COVID-19. So if we have them in one room, then when the doctor enters, they could put on their PPE, they could help each patient, and when they leave, they could then take their PPE off and dispose of it. The current way that we typically house patients is one person per room, 
And so as the doctor goes around to each room and they enter the room and help the person and exit the room, they have to take, they have to put on PPE and then take the PPE off. Put it on and then take it off. Put PPE on and then take it off. And so that's going through a lot of the resources that we have. So one way that we can maybe reduce the amount of PPE and N95 masks we're using is to just have more patients per room. Just an idea. Um, another idea, these are not things that we're doing everywhere. These are just ideas of ways to try to reduce the pressure on our medical industry right now is to ask the recovered healthcare workers, people who have gotten sick since we just talked about, you can't really get sick a second time, or we don't believe that you can. The scientists don't. If we take those healthcare workers who have recovered and have recovered healthcare workers and tell them don't use N95 masks or we could say PPE, that would help us so we wouldn't use as much PPE and they shouldn't need it because they shouldn't be able to get sick because they've already recovered from it. So their body has those antibodies. So if those healthcare workers have the antibodies, just telling them, hey, please don't use those N95 masks so we can save them for people who need them who haven't gotten sick yet. Speaking of antibody therapy or antibodies, if someone's been sick, they could then donate blood and we could create an antibody therapy from someone's blood who has recovered. Um, an idea then is to take that antibody therapy and to give it to healthcare workers. Now, if someone has not gotten sick yet, they don't have the antibodies, but if you give them the antibody therapy, you can actually inject the antibodies into their blood and then they'll be protected from being able to get COVID-19 because they have the antibodies in their body. But that doesn't last forever, so they'd have to continually get injections over and over again. And then another idea that some people have is to train um, furloughed workers. And furloughed, if someone's furloughed, it means that they're non-essential right now. So their employer has said like, hey, don't come to work. We we're not going to pay you, but, uh, you know, we don't have, we're not going to fire you, but you aren't going to get paid. We have no work for you right now. So come back when we're ready for you to come back. But for right now, sorry, you just got to hang out. So those furloughed workers could become medical, um, not professionals, but medically trained. So maybe they could help, you know, take the pulse or take people's weight and height and temperature um, or even just tell them where to sit in the waiting room or help them get through the different lines that are forming in our medical facilities. Right now, doctors are doing that. And if we could, and nurses too, and if we could get people who are not medical professionals to do those types of jobs and just do the basic healthcare, then we could free up the nurses and the doctors to go help the people in the actual rooms. And that would help get us uh, to a point where we could have more hands on deck in the important places if we could train some furloughed workers or maybe even our military or something like that. So we could have more people um, coming in because it's really hard to train someone to become a nurse or a doctor. It takes years and years and years, but we could give people basic medical training so that they could help with some of those tasks. So these are just some ideas. These are not necessarily happening. They're just ideas uh, to help protect our healthcare system and hopefully take some of that burden off of our healthcare system. All right, I'll catch you over there on part two. We've got more to talk about. Catch you there. See ya.